Hello, everyone. My name is TJ Billard, and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Applied Transgender Studies. And it is my great honor to welcome you all to this final event in the Center's Distinguished Lecture Series uh, for 2023. Uh, events in this series feature world-leading transgender scholars discussing their own original research with a broad audience of scholars, practitioners, and policymakers, as well as interested laypersons. And all of these events are just like this one, virtual, free to attend, and open to the public. Uh, and at the end of today's event, I will be announcing the first speaker in the series for 2024. Uh, so please make sure to uh, stay until the end for that. But for now, I'm delighted to hand off to Alex Hanna, who is a senior fellow here at the Center for Applied Transgender Studies, uh, Director of Research at the Distributed AI Research Institute and the uh, host for today's event. So Alex, go ahead and take it away. Thank you for passing this off to us, CJ. Thank you for hosting. Thank you to Chats for this. Really excited. Today for this talk, um, super excited for our talk here with Alethea. Alethea Zamatakis is a research assistant professor at the Institute for Sexual and Gender Minority Health and Wellbeing at Northwestern University. Her research focuses primarily on health equity for Black and Latinx transgender and non-binary individuals, specifically regarding HIV care and gender affirming care. Um, I'm really, really excited to discuss Alethea's great new book. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Thinking Cis is Gender Heterosexual Men in Queer Women's Roles in Anti Trans Violence. Um, and so uh, this book is, is published with uh, uh, Rowan Littlefield, is that right? Uh, okay, amazing. And so it is, it, is, uh, it is real. I think you can purchase it now. Um, and so the way we're going to run this, Alethea, Dr. Zamotakis, is going to uh, go ahead and present on this book for about 10 minutes and her and I will be in conversation for a little bit of time and in the last 15 to 20 minutes we want to hear from y'all and, and have a Q&A session. Um, so during the talk feel free to use the Q&A function in Zoom to submit your questions and uh, yeah we'll, we'll go from there. Alethea take it away. Awesome thank you Alex. Um, thank you everyone for being here and um, I'm very excited to, you know, be in conversation with you, Alex, um, about my new book. Um, and thank you to TJ and um, the Center for Applied Trans Studies for um, hosting this event. Um, I am going to read just a little bit from the conclusion of the book and then um, talk uh, a little bit about it. And then I'm excited to talk more with you, Alex. So uh, in writing this book, I aim to push past what I viewed as the limits of sociological theory, and in particular, the sociology of gender, sex, and sexualities. As noted at the start of the book, um, Schultz and Lagos, two sociologists, traced the three main domains of the sociology of trans studies in 2017. And these three domains included research that explores the diversity of trans people's identities and social locations, research that interrogates trans people's experiences within institutional and organizational context, and research that presents quantitative approaches to trans people's identities and experiences. Each of these foci of contemporary sociology of trans studies has important functions to play in decentering cisness from sociological scholarship, empirically and theoretically exploring the experiences, needs, lives, and desires of trans people, and quantifying and elaborating the institutional and systemic barriers experienced in everyday life by trans people. However, it's necessary to either build within trans studies a study of cisness um, or to counteract it with a critical cisness study. Um, several scholars are calling for such an examination of cisness in addition to a critical endosex studies um, in comparison to intersex studies. Jennifer Heights Thomas, an instructor of sociology and anthropology at Pacific University of Oregon, um, hosted a panel at the 2023 Society for the Study of Social Problems asking, how are cisness and endosex embodiment socially, historically, and medically constructed? How do race, nation, sexuality, and technology intersect in the production of cisness and endosex bodies? Um, in November 2022, Jackson King, author of Testo uh, Testosterotica, 
tweeted, enough of transgender studies is time for cisgender studies, asking among other questions, why do they feel threatened by the gender of others if theirs is so factual and secure? Um, a turn to critical cisness studies would ask, as I do in the book, what is cisness? How is it produced and maintained? What are its ramifications? How do um, you know, good, well-intentioned people perpetuate cisness in everyday life? Uh, further, such a field may ask what to do about cisness, uh, as I do in the conclusion. Um, and so throughout the book, uh, I explore from interviews with cisgender heterosexual men and cisgender and queer women um, throughout Metro Atlanta, uh, really how they understood gender and race and sexuality as it relates to, to, to desire of transgender women. Um, all of whom, you know, were recruited not really knowing that they were going to be talking about transgender things. Um, I did not out myself as trans to any of them. Um, the flyers did not say that it was about a transgender topic. Um, and really, I wanted to, you know, get people talking about transgender people in a way that, you know, isn't intentionally eliciting overly explicit transphobia or just, you know, explicitly pro-trans um, ideas and discussion either, but to really, you know, capture the nuance in things. I think a lot of times something that I talk a lot about in the book is that particularly with queer women, when we think about transphobia, we think a lot about TERFs, um, people like JK Rowling, um, who, you know, are explicitly anti-trans in their, you know, purported attempts to save cisgender white women from evil trans people. Um, and, uh, you know, that's the most obvious example of, of anti-trans sentiment. But I think there are so many other ways, as I show in the book, that, you know, those things occur and are discussed and are reified that then, you know, have larger implications. It's not just the way that individuals talk about it, but it filters down from, you know, the ways in which policymakers talk about trans people, the ways in which um, corporations talk about trans people, the ways in which all these people who have power over our lives talk about trans people and, um, you know, continue to shape the world around us. Uh, and so, um, this book is just, you know, one incomplete part of that larger conversation that I hope really, you know, contributes to a larger discussion of, uh, you know, how to better understand anti-trans violence um, and not just asking trans people, you know, what do you think about the possibility that you might experience violence and, and not just continuing to trace the limitations of quantitative data, um, you know, and the reality that we can't really ever fully quantitatively analyze, analyze anti-trans violence because of limitations in media reporting and police reporting and so forth, but to really turn, uh, you know, to the larger society beyond trans people to also begin to understand anti-trans violence. Uh, and so um, in the book, um, I uh, discuss in part you know, how participants responded to photos of transgender women that I presented them. Um, all of uh, the photos that I presented to participants were transgender women, but some were passing and, and some were not. And I put passing in quotations because that's large part of a larger piece of a conversation that I can't get into in 10 minutes. Um, but hopefully you can hear about more when you read the book um, or in conversation today if you have questions. But, um, you know, to really understand how people respond uh, to different women that they may view as trans or not and what it means to then be desiring those people and what it means when they find out that they're trans and, uh, you know, whether people um, feel like reacting with violence is justifiable and why is it justifiable? What makes it justifiable? And if it is justifiable to people, how then do we, you know, target the roots of that justification so that that's no longer a possibility? Um, and so uh, really um, throughout the book, I trace that through thinking about desire, thinking about the language that people use and um, thinking about also, um, you know, solutions to violence as well. 
Um, and so uh, I will stop there with my presentation um, so that uh, Alex, you and I can talk a bit more in depth about different pieces. Um, but I'm really excited to get into the meat of things and excited to answer any questions that people may have um, that they can put in the Q&A um, about anything I've said or anything that we will talk about. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alethea. That was an amazing, uh, just like kicking us off. And I do love your framing of this, thinking about what is left wanting in, in contemporary uh, trans scholarship, right? And so the articulation, I think, uh, of what you're doing here, I, I kind of scribbled in my notes in the book is that this is a bit of a, I kind of, I kind of say this is like, studying up which is sort of like you're not you're not necessarily centering insofar as like having trans transness under a microscope but the thing that is that is perpetuating anti-trans violence is cisness and the maintenance of cisness and methodologically i love how you couched this and you said well to study cisness we can't kind of study uh just like the people like turfs or whatever who are setting a certain kind of agenda but kind of people who are kind of trading in particular sort of discourses um, and using the kind of operative of desire, I thought was really, really interesting too, because, um, because it's sort of thinking about um, where there is a center or a locus of violence, which in, which in transness, uh, especially for trans women of color is, you know, kind of, these, these relations uh, of desire or in domestic violence or in situations in which um, uh, cis, cis partners feel deceived, quote unquote, deceived or whatever. And so one of the things I'd love for you to talk about in the book uh, is, is you talk in the intro about your theoretical apparatus in, 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 the, in the framework, I think that you and 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 I think I've relied on a lot too in kind of my thinking about you know Memembe and necropolitics and especially the productive development of um, of this in, between Jed Hardwin and, and C. Riley Snorton and, and trans necropolitics. And one of the ways I think that, that is interesting is that the way they talk about trans necropolitics is the way that white queers or queers more generally use trans death. And so one of the questions I want to ask and filtering that is like, how, how do we think about, how do we think about violence, especially how do cis queer women, um, L, uh, I think LGB women respond to violence compared to cis men who are orienting this in, a str in straight, straight relationships? Yeah, thank you. That's a really great um, question. And I think, um, you know, there are very, different and overlapping ways in which that plays out, you know, amongst my participants and, uh, you know, I think as well within broader society from, you know, other scholars who you just mentioned as well from their work. Uh, and I think part of it is that in general, right, the violence against transgender women in particular against Black and Latina transgender women is uh, really enacted by their partners, um, often by cisgender heterosexual men. And, um, you know, whether that's through, as you said, intimate partner violence or through sex work um, or, uh, you know, friend and familial relationships. Um, and uh, largely, largely, largely from cisgender heterosexual men um, is where that like physical violence comes from. Um, you know, something that was very evident amongst my participants and uh, I would argue, you know, is sort of a microcosm of the larger society is that in general, cisgender, lesbian, bisexual, and queer women aren't enacting physical violence against transgender women, um, you know, which in general mirrors larger violence patterns, right? In general, cisgender men are more likely perpetrators of physical violence than uh, cisgender women uh, statistically. But um, I think in part the ways in which these things overlap is the way in which people describe the violence, right? Like the cisgender, lesbian, bi, and queer women I spoke to 
you know, talked about transgender women as deceiving people, as assaulting people, as one of my participants said, and hopefully it's okay to say, uh, you know, within the setting is like, they fucked him up, right? Like they, um, like essentially assaulted him in many ways is how it's described, right? And uh, that's the same language that cisgender heterosexual men that I interviewed and who have been quoted responding to violence and justifying why they committed violence say, right? That this person duped me, this person tricked me, this person, you know, uh, it was so overwhelming, right? That I couldn't help but do this. Um, and, you know, participants even, uh, both men and women described, you know, not being told that your partner is trans as rape, for example, right? And um, if someone commits violence against you, right, like, why wouldn't you commit violence against them also, right? If someone has a gun to my head, why would I care about their safety either? And I think, um, you know, that is very much the case in terms of the participants I spoke to, right? They use the same language to justify the violence that occurs against transgender women. One group might be enacting the physical violence, but the other group is complicit in terms of, uh, you know, supporting it and, uh, you know, providing sort of like the language for people to use and to pull from, right? Um, we see that very clearly in, uh, you know, TERFs as well, for example, in terms of uh, transgender women being described as raping cisgender women just by existing, right, or um, being a threat of sexual assault if we enter the restroom, right, um, the same sort of language becomes used then to justify, you know, police responses to when we use the restroom, becomes justified by the men who kill transgender women, um, and um, and so those are really the clearest connections. I think in terms of necropolitics, you know, and for folks online who, who haven't heard of necropolitics, uh, Alex, uh, you know, mention of Jin Harwitawarn's queer necropolitics um, has really great, uh, you know, readings and, and introductions to uh, Mbembe's work. But necropolitics is really focused on, right, like, uh, violence having a purpose, violence producing something, right? And he talks about it a lot, which is very relevant to our particular moment in terms of Palestine, right? Like the dust of Palestinians produces life for the Israeli state um, and in very unfortunate and genocidal ways. Um, and, uh, you know, similarly, the, or, well, not similarly, but in a different vein, um, you know, violence against transgender women enables cisgender men to sort of recuperate their manhood in many ways, at least according to the participants I spoke to, right? Like men um, explained to me that if they were to desire a transgender woman and to be with her and then to find out that she were trans, you know, reacting violently, whether it's killing her or physically assaulting her, really enables them to reassert their masculinity, to reprove their manhood to other people. And that, you know, they were worried about what it would mean for other people to not view them as a man, as well as, you know, for some of the participants, the physical threats that would be uh, done to them as well. You know, one of my participants himself actually did desire transgender women and only dated trans women. And he talked a lot about um, you know, the violence and the jokes and the ridicule that he experienced from cisgender heterosexual women and cisgender men. Um, and um, so, you know, there are very real consequences to people who love us also. And so there are very real ways in which, you know, people try not to deal with those consequences in which they try to shed themselves of their attachments to us. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't, Think that's entirely mirrored in cisgender queer women. Um, but as I said, cisgender queer women, you know, continue to aid and abet the violence um, that cisgender men are, are perpetuating. Wow, yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's incredible. I, I'm thinking and chewing on this a bit. I was thinking about what it means, you know, and then you start with this great quote, right, from from Electra and, and, and Pose of that scene 
uh, in in Pose where they where they're they're you know the quote is you know oh oh no I'm gonna I gotta scroll to the back to to the top of the book because <laughs> I don't want to get it wrong um, you know but it's sort of like they don't the, the fact that it's like they don't they don't kill us because they hate us they kill us because you know they're afraid of how they're yeah what it would mean to love us right so that's the and and, and I think you're getting at a totally correct I mean the kind of idea that necropolitics is being has this sort of productive factor it's not negating but it's productive of reestablishing masculinity and reestablishing a type of cisness and reinscribing that um I have a bit of a maybe like a methodological question uh and and it's and it's about I want to kind of compare this um, because in in the book you use this photo elicitation study where you show you know these various various different women, all of whom are trans. Um, some of them are cis passing, some of them are not. And you know, I'm gonna bracket this conversation about passing because we could we could talk about passing for for quite a long time. Um, but it one of the things that I'd want to discuss is like. In the in the photo elicitation part of the book, there's not like a I don't think from from what I've read a, like anyone would say like well it's more of about a study of desire like who's the who's the one you would you know you'd hang out with but it seems like it's not until you were prompting them about violence that that there was really this even acknowledgement of potential violence so I I'm kind of curious on like this kind of move here in in an affect i'd say like between between violence and and kind of desire and 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 how both about like what does it mean to sort of go from there to like to maybe a to a situation in which violence is on the docket versus you know one in which it was sort of people your response talk wouldn't even necessarily even say the word trans they would use this coded language about uh you know cleanliness or um about makeup or about this managed appearance i'd love for you to sort of talk about what that barrier was or like and how respondents even got to the point of of, of even that violence was, was on the table yeah so um so kind of I guess to start at the end of your question and then work my way backwards. Um, so essentially within the interview, uh, I began, you know, asking initial questions about, you know, what they desired in a woman. And I did that intentionally because I wanted to start in a way that would begin to open them up about something that was a bit, uh, you know, less, uh, potentially controversial or less heated, right? Something that is just people talk about desire all the time, right? And are very used to, for example, on, on Tinder or on her or on whatever app, swiping on people, right? Um, and so um, I, after I asked those questions, I, I pulled out the photos and, you know, explained that I have photos of eight women that I wanted them to just, you know, take me by one by one and, you know, rate on a scale of one to 10, with one being entirely undesirable and 10 being extremely desirable, how desirable these women were to them. And then um, to really explain why. And, um, you know, interestingly for cis women, that was actually really hard to get them to talk about uh, who they desired and why they desired them or not. They were very uncomfortable with rating other people. Um, in comparison to cisgender heterosexual men, um, you know, for very, I argue in the book, cultural reasons around gender and the way in which gender operates, right? Like uh, cisgender heterosexual women and queer women may be critical of each other's gender expression and gender presentation, but when it comes to desire, cisgender heterosexual men in many ways are, you know, a bit more explicit in terms of 
you know, whether a woman is desirable or not, and what about her is undesirable, and all of the flaws within the woman that make her unattractive. And so it was much easier for cisgender heterosexual men to talk about each photo for like 10 minutes if they wanted to, um, about the things that they liked or didn't like. And, um, you know, as we wound our way through the photos, I asked them as well to pick out the woman they found most attractive. And that woman is who I used then to jump into questions around transness. Um, in part, as I said, because with the flyering and recruitment of participants, they didn't know that I was going to be asking anything related to transgender women. And so I wanted sort of a flow of conversation that would enable us to begin to shift towards violence. Um, but I think in many ways, actually talking about desire with them, you know, was very important for connecting desire and violence to go back to, you know, your question of they don't hate us, they hate what it means to love us. Um, cisgender heterosexual men are not, you know, unattracted to transgender women. Um, I think anyone who has ever done sex work would tell you otherwise. Um, and any other trans woman walking along the street having men solicit them, you know, will tell you otherwise, right? Like, uh, it, it is not uncommon for that to happen frequently. Um, I've talked to, you know, my cisgender women friends about just our differences walking on the street, right? Like men solicit me often, very overtly, whether it's just to go on a date or have sex or the other week someone stops me, assuming I was a sex worker. Um, and, you know, my and cisgender women in general, you know, unless they're in uh, you know, particular areas that have higher frequencies of sex work, um, you know, don't necessarily get solicited everywhere they go in the same way for sex work. They get cat calls, um, but it's a bit different in my opinion, in terms of the ways in which these things play out. And, um, you know, that's obviously also a raised in, in class discussion as well. Um, but to keep the thread within your conversation, you know, cisgender men desire transgender women, many do, um, but, you know, there, as I said, are consequences to that desire, right? Um, there are one consequences to, uh, you know, the relationships they have with friends and family members who, you know, when I asked participants, for example, like, would you tell partners would you tell, or would you tell friends and family if your partner were trans? You know, most said no. And when I asked them, you know, to really explain why they were afraid to lose their friends or they were afraid to have their friends make fun of them or to ridicule them and same with family members. Um, you know, cisgender men as well, uh, several of the men that I spoke with live in communities and neighborhoods within Atlanta that are hyper-policed and, um, you know, have higher rates of violence in general. Um, and uh, there's a wealth of research showing, for example, that exaggerating heterosexual relationships can provide sort of a buffer um, between uh, a person and, and uh, state violence, um, at least momentarily. Um, transgender women who don't pass don't necessarily provide that buffer, but might instead, you know, draw even more attention. Um, and uh, as well, you know, there's a lot of research that shows that uh, for Black middle class participants that I spoke to and Black middle class people in general, that there, there are class ways in which they try to differentiate themselves from working class queer and trans folks who, you know, uh, may not pass or may have different ways in which they present themselves that are a little bit more you know, uh, visibly trans or uh, not necessarily, you know, polite and respectable ways of dressing and acting um, to differentiate themselves as, as the good Black person versus the bad Black trans working class person. And so all of these things are interconnected, right, in terms of people desiring someone and simultaneously trying to avoid violence and inflicting violence. And the violence that transgender women experience as well is, is very passionate violence in many ways, right? It's not just someone being stabbed once, it's not someone being shot once, you know, it is someone being shot and then the person leaving and coming back to shoot them again, even though they're dead, 
or stabbing them multiple times. Or when I was writing uh, and editing the book, uh, I had just moved to South Shore, a neighborhood in Chicago. And I talk about this in the book where just, um, you know, like a mile away from me at the Walmart that I go grocery shopping at before uh, Walmart left the city, um, a black trans woman was found dumped in a dumpster, right, right next door. Um, and so, you know, this violence is not just sort of casual violence, right? Um, it's very deeply, I would argue, connected to the desire that people have for transgender women and the trans women that they kill, and a desire to be viewed a certain way in society. Um, and so each of those things are very interwoven, and it's a very messy, you know, complex conversation, I think, which also makes it difficult to paint this neat linear picture of violence, right? Um, there are so many interlocking factors around how this violence plays out, around why people commit the violence against transgender women that they do, um, that, uh, you know, there is no easy way to really portray that violence either. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's so important to draw those connections between the violence and how this is relating to intimacies and presentations around race, class, and kind of and and what it means to present to that and 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 how that supports a certain kind of uh, buffer uh, insert from certain other kinds of state violence. Um, that's so important to to discuss and to and to to talk about here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about other kinds of symbolic structures here, necessarily sort of the kind of um, the other kind of um, kind of intellectual super superstructures, I guess you could say, but sort of, and from that, I'm thinking particularly the media in here, thinking about how media perpetuates violence uh, against trans women of color. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about that in addition to other institutions that pick up these, these media depictions, including, as you talked about in your introduction, state institutions that are continuing to elicit panics, um, not only in kind of in, in the bedroom, but in on, on the sporting sports fields, um, in bathrooms, and other kinds of intimate um, in, intimate arenas. So yeah, I'd love for you to talk about, about that. Yeah, so I think in part to start with the media, you know, it was very um, surprise. I mean, I guess it shouldn't have been surprising, but it wasn't something that I thought about, you know, as a, I'm not a media scholar, so it wasn't something that I went into the picture with, but, you know, repeatedly participants drew on the media to make sense of transgender people, um, which is something I, I should have, you know, understood going in, but it wasn't something that I was necessarily thinking about. But I think in part, you know, uh, one of the harms of the way in which the media operates is that we don't really have many characterizations of transgender people within the media beyond, you know, characterizations of trans women as jokes or as threats. Um, most of my participants it was actually really hard to get them to begin to understand what trans meant. I had to explain it over and over to them. And, um, you know, in part because people really, you know, beyond certain circles don't talk a lot about transgender people or see transgender people, you know, uh, that frequently, even though they may be around trans people, they may see them, but they may not know, right? Or they may not necessarily, uh, you know, interact with that person in any real human way. Um, and so people have a real lacking of, of access to meaningful transgender representation um, in the media that could, you know, begin to actually shape the ways in which trans people are seen. Um, but people also talked a lot about, um, you know, shows like uh, Jerry Springer, um, for example, that, you know, uh, we're still playing even in 2010 on their college um, campuses and their uh, 
what's the word I'm looking for in their student centers, um, you know, with transgender people only being um, brought onto the show to sort of be the butt of a joke when a man says, oh my God, I didn't know she was a man, right? I didn't know she was a he. Uh, and it's this whole joke of him trying to figure out how to respond to this woman and talk about her and think about her. Um, and, and an entire joke that he was somehow, you know, bamboozled into loving a transgender person. Um, and so I think in each of those ways, you know, we see that that continues to play a picture in people's minds in terms of how they also view transgender people. Um, and I think to the second part of your question, you know, around um, the state and state institutions, one of the things I talk about uh, in the chapter where I, uh, in chapter two, where I talk a lot about the photos um, and desire is that, you know, people had a lot to say about what a transgender woman looks like, right? About like clues to look for. And so a lot of my participants would say, oh yeah, this photo, you're tricking me, right? This is a man. Um, and uh, I wouldn't tell them that it was a transgender person, but I would, you know, I wanted to know what they thought about that and why they were saying this person was a man. And they would draw on things like um, Adam's apples, right? Or um, also very strange things like um, a cleft chin, right? Um, and um, I used to have a bit more of a butt chin and one of my participants actually, who spoke a lot about that, flirted with me the entire interview. He wanted to go on a date, he wanted to, you know, he kept making remarks about us having sex. Um, and at the same time would say, yeah, if a woman has a butt chin, she's not really a woman, right? It's very arbitrary things that they would use to point these things out. But those same um, clues as to what a trans woman is, um, you know, are referenced also, for example, when uh, Trump was the president under his administration, HUD, the um, housing department, put out a memo to homeless shelters, right, of how to spot a transgender woman in order to keep her out of homeless shelters um, so as to protect cisgender women from sexual violence. Um, and, uh, you know, so those things are very connected in terms of, you know, clues being provided. Um, and then I think even larger than that, you know, and or not even larger, but in addition to that, so much of the violence that transgender women experience is in communities that are hyper disinvested in, right? Um, a majority of violence against transgender women is in the South. Um, and it's primarily in working class black communities that have been so disinvested in by the state that have, you know, existed under legacies of enslavement and Jim Crow and continued segregation today, uh, you know, in neighborhoods like South Shore Chicago, where you know, uh, while I was living there, um, you know, there are still lead pipes in buildings. There um, are, you know, uh, hundreds of empty homes that, you know, no one is living in because they can't afford them, but the state won't open that up to, to house people. Um, and, um, and so there are ways in which the state perpetuates this violence, right? We know that hyper inequality um, and in particular hyper income inequality and disinvestment in communities and over policing of communities all fuel violence. And so the state is very much invested in perpetuating violence against particular people. Um, and then the state also lets people off the hook for the violence, right? And people know that. People know that um, the government and the police will do very little when a black trans woman is killed. Right. Um, we see that again and again and again, even as the laws change. Right. Um, laws in California, for example, might say that a man can't claim that he was so panicked and overwhelmed by being with a transgender woman that he killed her. But it still happens. Um, and the courts still let people get away with this violence. Um, and so, you know, the people who inflict violence are, are obviously guilty of the violence that they inflict against other people. But and need to be held accountable for it. But there, there are so many other factors in terms of how our society is structured um, by state institutions that perpetuate this violence and then use um, you know, all of these ways to filter down the language that we also use 
um, against one another and the violence that we inflict against one another. Um, and even the police themselves look for clues, right, to identify whether someone is trans or not, to target them for sex work, whether they're a sex worker or not. Um, and so, um, you know, that I think is really hopefully part of my second book um, that really gets even more into that, you know, into these very material ways in which violence um, is structured by the state and by state institutions, including the media. I mean, the media isn't controlled by the government, but the media is owned by the same people who elect our politicians. So they're one and the same, in my opinion. Um, but um, I'll stop there so that I don't keep rambling. No, you're you're good. We could we could talk about the the, the was it the fourth the third estate? What is the media? I always forget which one. The third, fourth, sixth. Um, I don't remember. Um, I got to go back to read reading French Revolution literature. Um, let's talk. Let's talk a little bit about the material conditions because I want to. I want to. I want to talk about the kind of matrix here. And you had mentioned this kind of murder. Some murders of trans women of color tend to happen in poor neighborhoods in 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 the South, places where there have been historic dis disinvestment, where that being um, the legacies of slavery um, and, and redlining and Jim Crow, um, and then trans women of color um, it, um, engaging in sex work for, for survival. Um, I want to, I'm trying to formulate the question, but what I think I want to ask is, what are sort of, you know, like what are the ways in which you see, I'd say the relationship is between the symbolic violence that we get from media institutions and um, kind of tropes around trans women's lives and how that's related to kind of material, material conditions, material violence, uh, material violence. And, and I ask this because it's sort of like the, like, you can sort of, you know, there's, there's, there's this kind of, there's this kind of calculus and there's this kind of matrix that we see in which there's some very visible, you know, rich trans women, um, many of them were white, um, you know, many of them are recently gotten into it through kind of a nexus of visibility. Um, if, if they have any access to symbolic power and material wealth. Um, but I'd love for you sort of to like help us navigate these two and sort of thinking about like, you know, how those two are more intimately connected. Yeah, I think there are multiple ways. I think one of the ways is that, you know, the media in many ways, uh, you know, puts forth arguments and analyses and, and ideas of, of why things are the way they are, right? Providing sort of like justifications for existing conditions, right? I think it's something we see a lot now, for example, uh, again with Palestine, right? That the media exists to justify Israel and to relabel genocide as a conflict between, um, you know, to somehow equal parties. Um, and, uh, the media, in many ways, I would say within the U.S. as well, you know, functions to really provide sort of a picture of what's happening within our communities in a way that justifies that violence. And then people understand that violence through that framing, right? Like the way in which most people understand why th something is happening in another neighborhood is either through hearing about it from other friends or family or within the media, whether that's like Facebook or TikTok or, or it's the news or whatever. Um, and, um, you know, when we think about uh, the media and transgender violence, the media has played such a role in terms of misgendering transgender people so that we can't even, you know, know whether someone was killed or not. Um, they, you know, have also similarly uh, portray transgender women as a threat, as something that, you know, is uh, to be afraid of and feared and viewing transgender women as these sort of like Decepticons that 
um, you know, that cisgender heterosexual men need to be watching out for, um, and in many ways, victim blaming transgender women when they're killed, right? Um, and so much of that is repeated and reiterated within communities, right? Um, people see and hear what others are saying and, and repeat that as if it is taken for granted truth. Um, and, and I think we see that a lot with transgender violence. You know, people experience violence and then instead of placing the blame on where the blame needs to be placed, the blame is placed on other factors beyond someone's control. Um, and, uh, you know, that's the end of the conversation. And I think as well at this moment in time, the media has played a big role in terms of sort of dissuading us from thinking that this violence still exists and is still, you know, a rampant problem because at least within the US, I think it's very different in other places like the UK, for example. But in the US in general at this point in time, there is, you know, a much friendlier media presence regarding transgender people. That doesn't mean trans people are everywhere or that all trans representation is good. But, you know, like you said, trans people are more visible in the media. People like Caitlyn Jenner or Laverne Cox or Angelica Ross, um, you know, are all much more visible and present. Um, and, uh, you know, provide very strong and concrete examples of the reality that trans people can survive and thrive if they're wealthy um, or have access to like being actors and actresses. Um, but, uh, you know, there's much less conversation about the realities of transgender people, about, you know, everyday working trans people who are just trying to get by, who, you know, are struggling to survive, who are engaged in sex work, who, you know, are the people that you see at Starbucks or at the grocery store. Um, and I think so much of that negligence to our real lives also makes it all the more possible or impossible for people to see us as human, right? To see like real characterizations of who we are as people that could really humanize transgender people. Sorry, I'm using a Zoom on my iPad and it's so difficult. All right, um, thank you so much, Alethea. I like, I could talk all day with you about this about this book, but I want to get to some Q and A. Um, so I'm going to answer this ask this question from M, who asked if you're asked, are you planning on sharing some of your findings with participants? If so, how are you thinking about approaching this with your methods and methodologies? Yeah, I um, it's complicated. So I was not originally planning on presenting it back to them uh, when I did the research in part because, um, as I said, I didn't tell people that I was trans and I had participants who, for example, told me that, you know, if they saw a man trying to be a woman that they would shoot him and be happy, right? And, um, you know, and I was living very close to the communities that I did most of the interviewing in. Um, and so I had no desire to, you know, share back with participants the research um, because I also didn't want them knowing I was trans. Um, and, and I have thought about this since because I no longer live in Atlanta. Um, and I think it, it's complicated because it's been several years since the research. So, so yeah, there's no concrete answer to that. At the time, there wasn't. Um, my plan was not to for those reasons. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, a related question from Will is, um, um, like how you manage yourself emotionally during the interviews, especially when participants were endorsing violence against trans women? Yeah, it was actually very hard. Um, you know, uh, and it was hard for multiple reasons. 
it was hard one because of the violence it was also hard i experienced a lot of sexual harassment and threats of sexual violence while i was doing the research also and um that, for example the same participant who said he would shoot a man trying to be a woman also repeatedly was asking me to go around the corner and have sex with him um and then jumping back and forth to do you really have a do you have a vagina do you not have a vagina do you do you not like not sure if i was trans or not um and um so it was a lot of things happening that you know i was continuing to just smile at participants as they said these things to me you know in order to continue the conversation and in many cases i probably should have walked away um but i also you know took the risk upon myself of continuing the conversations in order to, you know, be able to sort of tell the story that I do in the book. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of emotionally managing myself, I cried a lot after interviews um, and I leaned on people. Um, you yeah. know, I called uh, my friends and my mom. I was in therapy, thankfully. Um, and, um, you know, works to really uh, process a lot of those things outside of the analysis, because I think that was something else that was really important to me was being able to not entirely disattach myself emotionally from the work, right? But I think it's, it could have, it, it would have been easier for me to over portray people as like these violent human beings that are just out inflicting violence, right? Um, based off the things that people said and and the emotions that I had in response to that. And I think it was important for me to process that and then go into analyzing the data um, to tell, you know, the nuanced story that I do. Um, and um, I, I mean, one thing that was important to me uh, and helped a lot in terms of both the emotional management and, and like physical safety as well was Partway through uh, the process, I actually began recruiting through the Atlanta Pre-Arrest Diversion Program um, and started doing interviews within their space. Um, and so it actually uh, made it a lot easier to emotionally manage the things that people were saying, because even though I was alone in a room with them, I, I didn't feel alone um, because there were other people in the building that were, you know, that were supportive of me and the work. and. Um, so all of that is to really say that I think having a community and having people who supported me are what enabled me to really emotionally manage it. Yeah, no, that's huge. I mean, that's huge. I mean, I'm reading so many questions about this in the in the question Q and A. I would, I personally, I would love for you to sort of write an article or some scholarship that was like how to do cis studies you know, like as a trans person, <laughs> like in a way that 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 prioritizes your own safety and 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 what you said I thought was profound. Off you offered your participants quite a lot of grace not to, you know, vilify them in the results, you know, they were promising violence and making sexual advances towards you. Um uh, I'm trying to think. This one question from Gabriella says, I feel a pressure from those who desire us to agree that we should hide our trans identity, not just for safety, but out of shame. Did you, did your participants who acknowledge desire of trans friends share that desire for transness to be hidden? Yeah, hi Ella. Um, uh, Ella is my femme tour. Um, and um, I think it, it was a yes and no. In terms of, for example, uh, there was only one cisgender man who was explicitly attracted to transgender women. Um, you know, two others were open to transgender women but hadn't ever dated or explicitly desired transgender women um, other than one participant who actually started dating a woman and then found out she was trans um and uh they stayed together and then broke up for other reasons but um it wasn't something that he necessarily shared because it's what she wanted um 
And so, you know, the cisgender men who explicitly desire transgender women did hide it um, from other people. You know, he actually, a lot of times wouldn't even say trans women about the people he desired. Uh, I had to like kind of drag it out of him because he kept, he could tell I was trans um, because he spent so much time with trans women. And he kept saying, you know, people like you. Um, but, you know, uh, he had a hard time, even though he spent so much time with trans people, and even though he desires them, you know, openly saying, even to me, that he desired transgender people. Um, and out on the streets, he did work to hide it a lot because of, you know, the, the ridicule and, and um, harm that he experienced at the hands of other people. Um, in comparison with cisgender queer women, though, the queer women I talked to who were open to transgender women, it was very different, actually. Um, you know, and, and this is one of the things that I talk about in the book that I think was very beautiful about some of these interviews was that, you know, they had a desire to protect transgender women. Um, you know, when I asked them, for example, if they would, how they would talk about their partner being trans to other people, it always came back to, well, does she want me to tell them, you know, or how does she want to go about this conversation? Um, as opposed to with men, when I asked them whether they were attracted to trans women or not, it was framed around, do I want to? Like, what would be the ramifications for me? And so I think there were very different ways in which men and women answered those questions. Um, and I think uh, as well, you know, different ramifications of that for their transgender potential partners. Amazing. Um, I'm gonna ask one more questions. This is kind of like a, you you alluded to your your next book, which is a lot to think about. Um, but someone asked, "What do you suggest as a next step to build upon this research?" And I just want to kind of get your sense of what's next uh, for 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 this work. Um, before we conclude? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. Thank you um, for the person who asked and for you asking as well, Alex. Um, I One of the things for folks who do read the book that you'll see, and I think is complicated in terms of how I wrote the book, is sort of this um, wrestling with, uh, you know, shifting away from discourse and at the same time analyzing discourse in the book and sort of this tension between like uh, how people talk about things and, and material violence. And um, so within the next book, my hope is really to, you know, have more of a materialist analysis of transgender violence to really look at, you know, the classed ways in which this violence is perpetuated and, and functions. And so much of that gets back to, you know, our conversation around uh, the state and the media and the ways in which this violence functions and, you know, that it is functioning in hyper disinvested in communities. And, um, you know, there are very large reasons why transgender violence is perpetuated in this country, right? Like politicians, uh, pull out anti-trans rhetoric all the time in order to sort of distract us from other conversations, right? Because it's very easy to get people to all of a sudden, you know, focus on targeting transgender people, uh, targeting drag shows, targeting queer people. Um, it, it's very easy to get people to shift in that direction, unfortunately, um, away from, you know, focusing on uh, organizing against our existing state. Um, and so really, you know, what I want to look at is um, what are, you know, the historical reasons that trans violence has come into existence. And I think a lot of scholars have really pointed to, you know, Christianity as one source of this violence, um, as well as, you know, white supremacy and colonialism. And I think it's important for us to ask, you know, but why? Like, what is the purpose of someone at some point creating, you know, anti-trans rhetoric, creating transphobia, at perpetuating this? Transgender people who are openly trans make up a very small, uh, you know, proportion of our world. Um, 
you know, what is the value of targeting transgender people when we make up at this point, you know, an estimated 1% of people if we're only counting people who openly identify in some way as, as trans. Um, and so uh, I want to dig into archival, um, you know, catalogs and, and really trace through all of the different interconnected conditions um, that were taking place at different moments in time that led people to really begin to create anti-cross-dressing laws, to create anti-sodomy laws that, you know, had an economic and political purpose behind them and to really understand that. Um, because I do think, as I wrote at the start of the book, that while people are accountable for the things that they do, the things that they say and the violence that they enact, you know, we aren't, we don't come into this world hating transgender people. Um, we are intentionally taught by the media, by churches, by other people to hate transgender people, to mock transgender people, to fear them. Um, and um, so how do we, you know, prevent that intentional uh, uh, creation of transphobia? And I think the way in which we do that is, um, you know, targeting larger uh, state and corporate and uh, governmental factors that in my opinion, create the silence. Yeah, no, I really can't wait for that work. And I think it's so important to extend this work and thinking about what work that transphobia does and how it is productive and what does it produce. Um, thank you so much, Alethea. It's a pleasure to be in conversation with you. If I had a physical copy of the book, I'd hold it up, get thinking, sis. Uh, there we go, out now uh, at your favorite bookseller. Thank you <laughs> to the center for, I don't know, uh, wherever you want to get it. Uh, thank you for the Center for Applied Transgender Studies. Someone asked if this will be available on the CATS YouTube page. I don't know. If TJ's on the line, they can answer that. <laughs> I'll pass it back to TJ. Uh, but but uh, yeah, but anyways, thank you so much. Thank you both so much. Amazing. Thank you. Yes, this will be available on our YouTube page uh, sometimes early next week. Um, thank you to both of you, uh, uh, Alethea and Han uh, Alex, for uh, a really wonderful conversation and to all of you uh, for being here with us today. Um, be sure, please, uh, to join us for our first event in the Distinguished Lecture Series for 2024. And that event will be held on Friday, January 19th from noon to 1 p.m. Central Time, uh, when we will hear from Zayn Morib, who will be discussing their new book, Terms of Exclusion, Rightful Citizenship Claims and the Construction of LGBT Political Identity, which is out now from Oxford University Press. And to register for that event, you can visit cats.events slash Morib, which is cats.events slash M-U-R-I-B. Uh, thank you all again, and uh, see you next year. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.